Hello and welcome to Logos Research Associates live stream broadcast. I'm Chris Roop, an ambassador for Logos Research Associates. It is my privilege to be your host for tonight's presentation. Logos Research Associates is a fellowship of scientists and scholars who are committed to upholding a high view of science and a high view of scripture. We believe that scholarship, logic, and the scientific method powerfully demonstrate that the Bible's historical claims are both credible and superior to the secular evolutionary model of origins. Logos sponsors numerous research projects and initiatives involving many different experts and scientific disciplines, all working towards the goal of increasing the explanatory power of the creation model of origins and of Earth history. We'll be sharing more about these exciting research opportunities in tonight's broadcast. We also want to caution our viewers. As humans, our scientific opinions are fallible and subject to change, and therefore we want to urge you not to place your faith in our organization or in any other human authority for that matter, but only in the finished work of Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for our sins and rose again on the third day, so that all who choose to repent and believe in him will not perish but have everlasting life. That is the good news, which the Bible refers to as the gospel. Sadly, many people do not take the gospel message seriously because they have been led to believe that science is in direct conflict with the Bible. And so you can't really trust what it says about the creation account, Adam and Eve, original sin, and the account of Noah, and most everything else that follows, including the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the coming judgment. This is why Logos Research Associates has decided to launch these live stream broadcasts. We feel it is that urgent and important. Our goal is to provide you with an opportunity to hear leading creationists who will be presenting cutting-edge scientific evidence in support of the creation account. This evening's lecture will address the often repeated evolutionary claim that humans and chimps share 98 to 99% of their DNA. This claim has been a major stumbling block to faith and has led many to reject the biblical account of creation and the gospel message. With that said, before I introduce our speaker to begin tonight's presentation, I'd like to open with a short prayer. Father God, I thank you for this opportunity. I thank you for all of our live listeners and listeners perhaps even years down the road. Lord, we pray for their ears, that they would be open to what we're having to say tonight. And I pray that they would be receptive, Lord, open to what you have to say. Lord, encourage them. May this bless them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Throughout tonight's presentation, we encourage you to submit any comments or questions on your live chat panel through YouTube or Facebook. We'll take some time at the end of the presentation to answer some questions from the audience, so please don't be shy. I now have the great pleasure of introducing our speaker. Joining us tonight is Dr. Jeff Tompkins, research scientist at the Institute for Creation Research in Dallas, Texas. Dr. Tompkins obtained his PhD in genetics from Clemson University in 1996. Soon after, he began working as a postdoc in a public genomic institute at Clemson and eventually became faculty member in the Department of Genomics and Biochemistry, and more impressively, the director of Clemson's Genomics Institute. Dr. Tompkins has published 57 secular peer-reviewed scientific papers in the field of genetics, genomics, cell biology, and proteomics. In addition, he has authored seven secular book chapters in the field of genomics and molecular biology. Dr. Tompkins' education, academic background, and full-time career in the field of genomics make him specially qualified to address the chimp-human DNA similarity claims made by evolutionists. In total, Dr. Tompkins spent over 20 years in academia working in the field of genomics before joining the Institute of Creation Research in 2009. Since then, Dr. Tompkins has spent over a decade extensively studying the alleged chimp-human DNA similarity claims, as well as other popular evolutionary claims such as the reputed chromosome 2 fusion, pseudogene claims, and more. Dr. Tompkins has recently conducted his own chimp human DNA analysis using the most accurate DNA sequence data available obtained from long-read DNA sequencing technology. Dr. Tompkins' genomic analyses have decisively refuted the widely touted 98-99% to chimp human DNA identity estimates, rendering the ape demand story genetically unfeasible. Many of the findings that will be presented in Dr. Tompkins' lectures have been detailed recently in his book, his up-to-date book, Chimps and Humans. I've had the chance to read through half of it so far. It's an excellent book, and it's a very easy read, so I want to uh, encourage you to check that out. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Dr. Jeff Tompkins to our broadcast. Jeff, 
We'd like to see if your mic works. Could you say something? Yes. Testing, testing, testing. All right. Loud How is that? Sounds great. Take it away. Can't wait. All right. Well, the title of my talk is Monkey Business in the Chip Genome, and you'll see why I chose that talk shortly. So let's get going. So Charles Darwin started this whole idea of evolutionary trees, and this is a, a tree image that, that he depicted, and he believed actually that humans evolved from apes and actually promoted that uh, in a book that was actually separate from his uh, Origin of Species book. And so that's really how the whole idea uh, got going was uh, back in the 1800s with, with Darwin pushing that concept as well as a, a number of his colleagues during that era as well. And so evolutionists like to, to think in terms of evolutionary trees to the origin of life. And of course, they believe that that occurred over, over millions of years. But creationists basically look at reality, uh, in my humble opinion, and they see a lot of different kinds of creatures and diversity within those kinds. But they do not see an evolutionary tree, but created kinds with diversity within each kind. And the term that we like to use is a creation orchard. So in other words, we see lots of different kinds of creatures with variability in those kinds, but we don't see them connected in a big tree of life. And so this is just a picture kind of illustrating that we see a lot of variation within humans with skin colors and facial features and other things. And of course, a lot of variation within what we call the dog kind and roses and, and all sorts of creatures. So that's basically what we see in the real world. And it really uh, corresponds well with what we know from the book of Genesis, where God said that, that everything was created after its kind. But more importantly, humans were created in the image of God. So where did this whole idea of chimps and humans being a close ancestors come from? And we're going to talk about that. So in the modern era, uh, most scientists would claim that uh, chimpanzees are our closest living ancestor. And so if you were to look at a, a phylogenetic tree or an evolutionary tree with, with humans up there at the top, then we were are supposedly most closely related to chimps, then gorillas, then orangutans, those are the great apes. And then as an outgroup, we have a rhesus macaque or a monkey. So Evolutionists would basically place humans and these various apes uh, in this kind of a, a tree with monkeys, you know, down there below at the bottom of the tree. So this is the standard evolutionary tree for human evolution. But as many of you know, uh, evolutionists never can really agree among themselves on, on most on most things. And this is an interesting paper that was actually published in 2009. And it's called the evolution of the second orangutan phylogeny and biogeography of hominid origins. And these people actually claim that based on anatomical features, not DNA, uh, that humans are most closely related to orangutans because they tend to share more anatomical traits with orangutans. The fact of the matter is, is that orangutans, uh, chimps, and, and gorillas uh, are all created kinds, in my opinion. They all have their unique uh, composite of traits. And yes, you know, there, there are some rough similarities with humans, but they're all separate kinds. So when I first began investigating this issue, I began looking at some proteins and, and constructing evolutionary trees based on software that took protein sequences and aligned them and then put them into a tree format based on similarity. And I came up with all sorts of different things. So in this particular tree, uh, which is based on an alpha motif protein 11, um, according to this, humans are most closely related to gorillas and then rhesus macaques, which are monkeys, they're not even a great ape. And then orangutans, and there's chimp at the bottom. And here is an example of another protein, ACAP3. And once again, we get a, a completely non-evolutionary tree. So I began seeing this mosaic uh, with molecular sequences. And what's really interesting, when I began looking at the literature, I found some some problems uh, amongst the evolutionary community with the, the things they were publishing. 
So this is a 2007 paper. It's called Mapping Human Genetic Ancestry. And they actually took a DNA sequences that were similar between humans, chimps, and gorillas. And they found out that only, they say this is a quote from the paper, for about 23% of our genome, we share no immediate genetic ancestry with our closest living relative, the chimpanzee. And these were DNA sequences that were cherry picked to be similar between humans and apes, and, and they could not get any kind of a, a solid consensus either. And so this is a, actually a kind of a hidden fact among the evolutionary community that people don't really hear much about. This paper uh, is the, the uh, gorilla genome paper that was published in 2012. And once again, they saw the same kind of discontinuity um, in their data as well. And they said this in this paper, in 30% of the genome, gorilla is closer to human or chimpanzee than the latter are to each other. So there isn't this really broad evolutionary tree consensus between humans and great apes. But what about this whole idea of DNA similarity? So many of you have probably heard the DNA of humans and chimpanzees is 98 to 99% identical. You hear that, you know, when you tune into the Discovery Channel and see a show on human evolution or something of the sort, you'll hear things like this or just on the internet or wherever. So this is a common uh, idea or meme that is put out there that, that most people tend to run across at one point or another. Well, when they first began sequencing uh, chimpanzee DNA, they published this paper in 2002, and this was before they even put together the chimpanzee genome. But they sequenced uh, about 3 million bases of chimpanzee DNA just randomly all over the chimpanzee genome. And then they queried that DNA against humans. And, and this is what they said in the paper. It's a direct quote, about two thirds could be unambiguously aligned to DNA sequences in humans. So only two thirds of the chimp DNA sequences that they got at the beginning of the chimp genome project, they could even accurately align onto humans. And so when I saw this, I thought, hmm, there's something funny going on here. That doesn't sound like 99% DNA similarity to me. And then I began looking at the top six human chimpanzee DNA similarity papers that were claiming a 98.5 DNA similarity with humans. And I actually published this paper uh, with Jerry Bergman in the Journal of Creation. It's titled Genomic Monkey Business Estimates of Nearly Identical Human Chimp DNA Similarity reevaluated using omitted data. So in these six papers where I could figure out what they threw out and did not include in their analyses and I factored back in, I came up with DNA similarities in these various uh, papers ranging from 66 to 87.87% similarity when I factored the data that was thrown out back into the analysis. So at this point, I'm really beginning to think, you know, there's some major issues going on with this whole paradigm. And so I began really to have, began having some major questions. Well, let's look at the, the big chimpanzee genome paper that was published in 2005. This was the first draft of the chimpanzee genome. And I just did some basic calculations. I looked at the percent uh, alignment, DNA alignment identity. So when you compare two sequences to each other, you get a, an identity. And I multiplied that by the amount of DNA that was aligned. And I divided that by the, the human genome size that they uh, knew at the time in 2004. And then, of course, just times 100 to get a percent. And just from this paper, I came up with an 81% overall DNA similarity, although they didn't say that in the paper, but you can go into the paper and do some basic math and come up with that yourself. So at this point, I'm really beginning to have some major doubts about what the, the evolutionary community was pushing. 
So let's let's look into this whole idea of DNA similarity and, and so we can get some background on, on how you can determine that. So how have evolutionists achieved estimates of high similarity? Well, first of all, they've omitted the non-similar regions of the genome. And a lot of this is just, just a practical fact. You cannot compare regions of genomes that are so dissimilar that you can't even get the algorithm to match things up. And then that's one thing that I ran across in my own research. So they basically threw out the, the non-similar regions and they only compared the highly similar segments. In fact, one thing that, that's been very popular in the early days of comparing humans and chips was to just to compare the exons or the protein coding regions of genes that were similar between chimps and humans. And more specifically, that was typically done just with the, the stuff uh, that was metabolic, metabolic type proteins that are basically similar between most mammals anyways, even between say humans and rabbits or humans and rats. And so they would just compare those regions that were highly similar. So what do we call this? Well, I call it cherry picking cherry picking the data to produce uh, information that supports your paradigm. Let's talk a little bit about the Human Genome Project. So the first uh, two drafts of the Human Genome were done in 2001, and there was two projects. One was going on in the public sector, and the other was in the private sector. And there's a picture of Craig Venter there and Francis Collins. Craig Venter was running the project in the private sector. Francis Collins at the time uh, was the head of the Human Genome Project running it in the public sector. And so they agreed to publish their results at the same time. And that was 2001. That was the first draft of the Human Genome. And then this, the draft of the first draft of the Chimp Genome, which I mentioned previously, was done in 2005. And we're going to talk about what the difference is between these two projects, and that's actually very important. So in the Human Genome Project, they literally had billions of dollars to throw at it. They had labs in the United States, in Europe, in Japan, <clears throat> contributing to the Human Genome Project. And it was a very uh, methodical and very well-funded project as compared to the chimpanzee genome project where they didn't have a whole lot of money and you're going to see why that was uh, that's important to consider as well so what about this whole idea of dna sequencing so a lot of people out there think that dna sequencing is this cut and dry science that it's there's no <laughs> you know you stick the dna sequence in the in the machine and out or the you stick the sample in the machine and out comes the DNA sequence. So I've got the picture of the pictures from Star Trek there where they went to a new world and found some creature, took a sample, stuck it in the computer and out came the DNA sequence. But unfortunately, it's not that simple. DNA sequencing is a somewhat uh, a messy affair, in, especially in the past when they were sequencing the chimp genome. So let's talk about these two different genome projects. So in the human genome sequencing project, it was very methodical. I call it a page by page sequencing strategy just to make it simple. So think of the human genome as a set of encyclopedias. Each encyclopedia would represent a chromosome and then each page within each encyclopedia would represent a section of that chromosome. And so in the Human Genome Project, they literally did things page by page, very methodical, and because they had lots of money and lots of people working on it. But what about the chimp genome? Well, they didn't have a whole lot of money for that. The budget was limited. The amount of labs and people that were working on it were, were pretty limited as well. So they did this all at once sequencing strategy. When I was Working at Clemson and back in back uh, in the technology there, we called it shotgun sequencing. In other words, think of the chimp genome once again as a set of encyclopedias, each encyclopedia representing a chromosome. But instead of sequencing page by page, think about throwing the entire set of encyclopedias into a paper shredder 
and shredding the entire set of encyclopedias all at once. So how are you going to sort out all of that when you get done? You're going to have a whole lot of DNA sequences, but you don't really know where they go. So is what they did was they assembled the chimpanzee DNA sequences that they produced. And on average, these were probably, these were about 700 to 1200 bases long based on the Sanger style sequencing that was used at the time. And they assembled them onto the human genome. Why? Because according to the scientists, hey, we evolved from a chimp. Chimps are our closest ancestor. Let's just use the human genome to sort all of this out. And of course, they ended up with a rough draft, uh, but it was all assembled and lined up onto the human genome. So they had a whole lot of islands of DNA sequence that they aligned onto the human genome with lots of gaps in between. So I like to explain this to people by, by thinking about how you would put together a jigsaw puzzle. My wife's parents love putting together jigsaw puzzles. Well, how do you do it? You dump all the pieces out and how do you put them together? Well, you look at the picture on the box or the little poster will come in the box and you look at that. So in other words, when they put together the chip genome, they looked at the picture on the box and what was that? That was human. That was the human genome. There's a lot of problems with this and even the evolutionists themselves or the scientists in the evolutionary community have acknowledged this. So this was a paper, a very important paper, in my opinion, that was published in 2018. It was published in Science, and this project was done at the Genome Center in Seattle, Washington. Uh, Evan Eichler was the head PI over this project, a very famous genomics guy. And they said this in this paper in 2018. And by the way, uh, this was done with brand new DNA sequencing technology that produced very long DNA sequences, is very accurate, and it also pretty much removed the problem of human DNA contamination, which we're going to talk about in just a little bit. But they admitted what was going on here in these early, the early years of the CHIMP genome project, and also for that matter, uh, the Gorilla Genome Project and the Orangutan Genome Project. And they actually resequenced chimpanzee, uh, gorilla and orangutan resequenced their genomes with this brand new technology. And they said this in the paper, higher quality human genome assemblies have often been used to guide the final stages of non-human genome projects, meaning apes, including the order and orientation of sequence contigs, and perhaps more importantly, the annotation of genes. And what was the end result of all of this? They say this bias has effectively humanized, humanized other ape genome assemblies. A very honest and candid uh, statement, which I found to be entirely true in my studies of, of ape genomes and especially chimpanzee. These genomes have been humanized because they were assembled and put together based on the human genome admitted by the evolutionists themselves finally in 2018. Here's a very interesting uh, paper that was published and the title of this, actually this was published about a year later by this Evan Eichler, the guy I just mentioned that was in charge of the other paper that we just talked about. And the title of this was Genetic Variation, Comparative Genomics and the Diagnosis of Disease. And he said this in this paper, Non-human primate genomes have not been finished to the same standard as the human reference genome and typically carry hundreds of thousands of gaps of, gap, of gaps precisely over these regions of complex genetic variation. So not only were previous genomes uh, from the various apes humanized, but they contain lots of gaps and they are very much rough drafts. They're not really complete genome sequences like the human genome is. And I should mention since 2001, when the first drafts of the human genome were first published, they have been uh, continuing 
to sequence the human genome and close all of the gaps in the human genome and produce a very uh, highly finished version of it. Although I don't know that they're still entirely done with human yet. There are still a few gaps here and there. Uh, but the human genome is relatively fairly complete now, but the eight genomes are still uh, in the rough draft uh, stage for all practical purposes. Well, one of the problems that I really began to run into in, in looking at uh, the chimpanzee genome and the DNA sequences that were produ produced during the, the chimp genome project was this problem of human DNA contamination. So here's two papers that were published, one in 2011, one in 2016. Now, the one in 2011 says abundant, abundant human DNA contamination identified in non-primate genome databases. So they didn't even look at great apes. They looked at, at other things that had been sequenced, other model genomes and creatures that had been sequenced. In fact, they found 3 million bases of DNA in the zebrafish genome on chromosome number three, entirely human. 3 million bases of a segment of a fish genome was entirely human because of human DNA contamination. And in 2016, they began looking at the problem again to see how pervasive it was. And they published this paper, Human Contamination in Public Genome Assembly. So they found out that some genomes in the public databases had literally up to 10% human DNA in them. So how do you get human DNA in a fish genome or any other genome for that matter that's not human? Well, I ran a genome lab. I know what people in the lab do. I had roughly about 20 people working for me in various functions. And in the lab, you know, people are talking, they're sneezing, they're coughing. You've got DNA on your fingers, on your, even if you're wearing gloves, you've got DNA on your gloves. There's DNA floating around in the air, through the ventilation system. There's human DNA everywhere. And so in the early stages of genome projects, we had no clue that, that this was that big of a deal, but it really was. So, so things have been improved uh, since then as far as lab techniques and, and avoiding human DNA contamination. But it was a huge problem uh, in, in the 1990s and, and at least up through, I would say, 2000 and in 10, maybe even up to 2015, it was still a huge issue. So anyway, so this brought up a lot of questions to me, looking at these papers about all this human DNA contamination. I thought, is the chimpanzee genome really accurately assembled? You know, if it's based on the human genome, but more importantly, is human DNA contamination a problem in the chimp genome? Well, that would be a huge problem because that would really jack up the similarity. So let's talk about what is the actual DNA similarity between humans and chimpanzees and how can you even determine this? Let's kind of do a little, uh, do a little lesson here on DNA similarity and, and how we look at that and, and assess that. So this is a hypothetical set of sequences. One is human, one is chimp. And where you have a T in human, you have a T and chimp and so on and so forth. So the vertical line represents an identical base between humans and chimps. So you have T, C, G, A's, the letters of the DNA alphabet. And you can see in this particular example, we have a 100% DNA similarity. So what if you get a base change that's different? So in this case, you can see in red, there's a C in human and an A in chimp. There's no vertical line there, meaning there's no match. So in this particular hypothetical example, 27 out of the 28 bases would match, and that would be a 96% similarity. But it's not that simple because not only do you have these base changes, which we call substitutions in the the DNA sequencing business and comparing DNA sequences. But you also have these other things that we call indels or insertions and deletions. So indels can be a single base where you have a, an insertion in one creature that uh, is a single base, or you can have multiple bases. And in fact, 
indels or insertions and deletions can be anywhere from a single base up to thousands of bases. So in this particular hypothetical example, uh, we have substitutions. And if we just count those, we have a 98% similarity. But if we include the insertions and deletions in this particular example, we get an 81% similarity. So that's just kind of something to keep in mind as, as we're moving along here. So one of the uh, first papers that I did was in, uh, actually I did several, but th this was one of the, the ones where I finally was able to to get the algorithm to function properly. Because uh, when I first began getting into this whole area, I found out that the algorithm that, that NCBI or your tax dollars paid for uh, had major problems and would kick out DNA sequences when you did massively large data sets, which is what I was doing, which is what most people didn't use the algorithm for. They only used the algorithm for small data sets, but I was literally using it on millions of DNA sequences. So I complained to NCBI and they actually fixed the algorithm <laughs> based on my complaints and me sending them data and sending them results and so on. And they fixed the algorithm. So in 2016, I was actually working with an algorithm that was functioning properly based on my complaints and interaction with the NIH. And so I looked at all all 101 chimpanzee trace read data sets. So these are the the DNA sequences that come straight off the DNA sequencer. Uh, I trimmed them up to remove the the ends you know, where the reads were, were rather vague or whatever. So I trimmed these DNA sequences. I removed any uh, bacterial contamination, which is just common to do in the DNA sequencing business. And so I basically took uh, samples from each one of these 101 data sets. I sampled 25,000 DNA sequences at random uh, from each of the data sets, just based on the, the out the I basically had to write a lot of my own algorithms in Python uh, to do the random sampling and just basic you know basic housekeeping stuff like that but anyways so I took uh, 25,000 DNA sequences at random from each of the 101 data sets that went into the chimp genome project between 2002 and 2010 those were the years that uh, that they used the Sanger style DNA sequencing uh, to to put together the chimp genome. So I had a total of 2.5 million DNA sequences on average, uh, after I trimmed them up and cleaned everything up, they were set about 700 bases long each. And then I queried those onto the human genome using the BLASTN algorithm. So is what I did was I just basically uh, logged the best hit. So, oops. So basically you get lots of, of hits in in a uh, a query with the blast end algorithm it, it'll it might hit all over the genome because it might have some repetitive sequence in it so basically i just took the top hit the best hit that had the longest read and i uh, analyzed the top hits from all of those millions of dna sequences so this is the overall uh, identity of these dna sequences uh, and I, I basically, the nice thing about Sanger style sequencing is, is that you get a lot of metadata with each DNA sequence. And so using uh, a relational database and, and doing some programming with that in SQL, I basically was able to map out uh, the DNA similarity of these various data sets over time because each a DNA sequence had a timestamp on it when it was produced, what lab it was produced in, um, the date, you know, obviously it was produced on. And so I mapped all of this out. And <laughs> the one thing that I saw over time, beginning in 2002 to 2011, when the last data set was produced, was the DNA similarity was dropping over time rather <laughs> dramatically. Why was the DNA similarity of these chimp DNA data sets dropping over time? I think it was because of human DNA contamination. So just to make a long story short and to summarize this data, 
between 2002 and 2004, which was really the, the first half of the CHIMP genome project that went into that 2005 CHIMP rough draft genome assembly paper that we talked about, uh, the average DNA similarity of the sequences was 92% compared to human. However, during 2005 and 2011, it changed by 7% and it was only 85% similar to human. So what's going on here? Um, the DNA sequence actually came from the same chimp. His name was Clint. Clint the chimp. And uh, so why is his DNA sequence becoming considerably less similar to human over time? Well, I think it's because in the early years of the chimp genome project, it was full of human DNA contamination, which we just talked about as being a major problem in the public databases. So what a mess. Um, it seemed like when I, the deeper I got into this project, the bigger a can of worms it was. <laughs> <It's> just... <laughs> so anyways, <clears throat> you remember that I talked about that one particular paper that was published in 2018, where they used a brand new DNA sequencing technology. And so Evan Eichler's group uh, up at the University of Washington in Seattle, they've got these, pat what they're called PAC bio sequencers. It's a, it's a proprietary a technology, but these sequencers cost <laughs> roughly about 3 million bucks a piece but they produce really nice DNA sequence. Uh, in fact, they can produce DNA sequence reads that are 30,000 bases long or more. And you think about that compared to previous DNA sequencing technology, the, uh, the early DNA sequencing technology, the Sanger style sequencing would produce reads about 700 to 1200 bases long. And then we had what was called the next generation sequencing or Illumina based short read sequencing, where although they could produce considerably more sequence, a greater amount of bulk sequence, the sequences were actually, once you paired the reads up, were only about 300 bases long. So you look at this new technology where they can actually produce 30,000 high quality bases of DNA in a, in a single DNA read, that's pretty impressive. And so, with this new technology, not only do you get longer reads and uh, you know, you're able to produce better genome assemblies, but you can also pretty much tell with a 30,000 base read whether there's it's human DNA contamination uh, or it's really chimp DNA because it's a sequencing by synthesis type reaction. So anyways, you get lots of bases and for the most part, it's pretty accurate. And so anyway, so I downloaded uh, 18,000 random uh, pack bio sequences that I pulled off the NCBI database. And then I used the uh, blast end algorithm again and compared those to human. And I used the most liberal gap extension parameters I could put on the algorithm so that it would jump over uh, small insertions and deletions. Of course, when the algorithm hits a humongous gap that it can't bridge because you've got a, a huge second section that's present in human, absent in chimp, or present in chimp, absent in human, uh, the algorithm can't, can't get over that, that particular gap, so it, it breaks off the alignment. So on average, these PAC bio DNA sequences were 30,000 bases each. And like I said, I, I chose 18,000 of those at random and queried them against human. Got some very interesting results. So of those 30,000 bases on average, I could only, the algorithm would only line up a third of that. It would only line up 10,000 bases before it hit a gap that was so dissimilar that it couldn't get across it. So what does that tell you? So of those 10,000 bases uh, per 30,000 base reads that I could match up onto human, the average identity of the alignment uh, was only 84% similar to human. And of course that didn't include the stuff that I couldn't even match up because 
of the limitations of the algorithm. So, and I actually published a paper on that and Chris Roop, I think, put up a link uh, to that 2018 paper that I published. But what was really interesting was the very same year I published my paper, Richard Buggs, who is a professor of evolutionary genomics at the University of London, Queen Mary, actually took data from a different algorithm. It was the BLAST-X algorithm and he downloaded it and did the analysis uh, himself and found out that overall the chimp genome was only 84% similar to human. Pretty much the exact same number that I came up with. And to my knowledge, Richard Bugs has not uh, budged on this. And so very interesting, two separate projects the same maximum DNA similarity. And of course, Bugs project as well did not include uh, the regions of the genome that were so different that you couldn't even compare them. So 84% maximum, uh, the real similarity overall is probably much less than that. So what's the, what's the big evolutionary problem with 84%? A lot of people ask me that when we go and, and speak in churches and things, and people say, well, isn't that pretty similar? Well, no. Not really, because evolutionists in their theoretical models where they, they actually invoke uh, a, a form of statistical analysis uh, based on what they call the neutral model of evolution, they need a 98.5 to 99% genome similarity to explain human evolution theoretically with no mutation rates. In other words, the mutation rates that they found in large human populations like big Amish families or big Mormon families. Uh, and of course, they've actually looked at mutation rates and populations of chimps out in the wild. And so based on all of these things that they factor in, they need a 98.5 to 99% genome similarity uh, based on the known mutation rates that they have for humans to have evolved from a common ancestor with chimps uh, anywhere between three to six million years and some evolutionists will even add a few more million years to that. So basically 84% uh, pretty much boots the evolutionary model of human evolution out the door. So I wanna talk briefly uh, about the, the chromosome fusion aspect of my research. I'm not gonna get super in depth into this, but I think it's connected uh, to this paradigm. In fact, it's Here's a book by Daniel Fairbanks uh, that he published. And of course, it's a pro-human evolution book. And he, the name of the book is Relics of Eden, The Powerful Evidence of Evolution in Human DNA. So what do you think Daniel Fairbanks has for the first chapter in his book? Is it human chimp DNA similarity? No, it's the, this idea of a chromosome fusion. And so, what is this whole idea of fusion? Most people have heard the human DNA similarity argument. But they've never heard about the fusion hypothesis. I've actually published, uh, here's four of the papers I've published on it. I've actually published another one at the 2018 ICC that I don't have up here. So I've published uh, quite a few papers on this whole issue, just looking at it in depth and uh, so anyway, so what is this whole idea of the chromosome fusion? Well, humans have 46 chromosomes. That's the diploid number of chromosomes uh, in the human genome. But chimps have 48 chromosomes. So why the difference? Well, evolutionists claim that what they now call uh, chimp chromosomes 2A and 2B somehow fuse together to form human chromosome number two. So where did this whole idea get going to begin with? Well, in the early 1980s, I believe this was done in 1982, I think this particular paper, these are cytogenetic uh, pictures of human chromosome 2 and chimp chromosome 2A and 2B. So this is from what we call a karyotype. So during mitosis, the chromosomes become all scrunched up. This is not what chromosomes look like in a normal functioning cell, but this is when they get all scrunched up. Uh, in the process of mitosis and cell division. And so you can stain them with uh, various stains and you can light up these bands. 
And so these bands do not correspond to genes. <laughs> they, they correspond to basically GC content and AT content in the chromosomes. But anyways, so it's a very crude way of doing DNA similarity. But anyways, evolutionists noticed that the chimp chromosomes 2A and 2B had a lot of similar bands, or in other words, just similar GC content in various regions to human. And so they lined them up like this. One of the problems is, is about 10%, uh, I can't remember if this is chromosome 2A or 2B, but one of them isn't even represented in the so-called fusion. That's a pretty big chunk of DNA there. And of course, all of the bands aren't really nearly identical anyways. But based on this crude cytogenetic similarity, they claim that chromosome 2A and 2B fuse to form human chromosome 2. So let's look at a, a, a graphic of this to make some sense of it. So basically, if you had uh, two chromosomes, chimp chromosome 2A and 2B fuse, uh, you should get the signature of that fusion, which evolutionists actually think they found in 1991. Uh, when DNA sequencing began to pick up speed, they were actually able to, to pull DNA sequences out and, and actually determine, you know, what, what the sequence actually was. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. So if this was true, this would be the first such case of a telomere-telomere fusion. So what do I mean by that? Well, in... There are known fusions in living mammals, but they always involve a type of sequence called satellite DNA. So we see satellite, satellite DNA fusions involved in chromosome fusions in, in occasionally, it's very rare, but we do see it in nature. We also see occasionally a telomere satellite DNA fusion in nature, but we never see telomere telomere DNA fusions in nature. The only time we ever see them is in e immortalized cancer cell lines. And so cancer cells uh, are not normal, healthy cells. <laughs> in fact, uh, cancer cells are basically in culture, have all kinds of chromosomal aberrations. Uh, and this is one of the ones you find, but you never find telomere telomere DNA fusions out in nature in, in living functional animals. So if this occurred in humans, that would be the first case of such an event. So what are telomeres anyway? So here's a cytogenetic spread uh, of mitotic human chromosomes, and the telomeres are lit up with fluorescent uh, probes. So you can see them lit up there, the telomeres at the ends of these chromosomes. And so the telomere sequence uh, in humans is this TTAGGG sequence. It's a six base sequence repeated uh, perfectly over and over and over and over again. And of course you have the complement on the other DNA strand, uh, which is the A's would match with the T's and the C's with the G's. So you'd have AATCCC on the other strand. So anyways, that's what, and by the way, human telomeres are 5,000 to 15,000 bases long of this perfect six base sequence. 5,000 to 15,000 bases long. They're very long. And so God in his amazing engineering is seen in the cell, has this protein complex sitting at the end of telomeres. It involves multiple proteins and it's called the Shelterin protein complex. And it actually protects the ends of telomeres and keeps them from fusing. And it's also a very, it's not just a static uh, protein complex. It actually is dynamic. It functions uh, with other features in the cell and is involved also in controlling cell division. So the ends of telomeres are not just hanging out there, just waiting to get fused. They're actually protected with these sheltering complexes. And so anyways, a lot of people don't realize that, but, but the ends of telomeres are very dynamic, uh, protected functional places. So what about this so-called fusion site that evolutionists found in 1991? 
Well, the fusion site is only 798 bases long, and you would think, well, if human telomeres are 5,000 to 15,000 bases long, wouldn't we see a fusion site that was 10,000 to 30,000 bases long? No, we see this, this 798 base sequence. And so the forward uh, telomere sequence in this so-called fusion site, what evolutionists would call a head-to-head -head fusion, <clears throat> the only intact sequences that we see in, in uh, the TTAGGG side of the equation here are highlighted in red. Uh, the actual fusion site there is highlighted in yellow, and the intact uh, reverse complement sequences are highlighted in blue. And so when evolutionists actually found this, uh, they called it uh, very degenerate <laughs> for obvious reasons because we're not seeing perfect uh, telomeres here, telomere sequences being fused. It's very degenerate. In fact, it's only about 70% similar to what would be a pristine fusion uh, of the same size, 798 bases. So it's got some issues. And why is it this degenerate if humans only evolved from chimps or a chimp, an ancestor that we shared with chimps three to six million years ago? And so I began looking into this even more. So I actually began by first querying the uh, 798 base pair uh, fusion site. Uh, I queried it onto the human genome. And it actually hit in multiple places uh, there on chromosome 2. And in fact, it hit in various places all over the human genome. And I was actually have been discussing with Chris Roop here that it looks like there is a multiple head-to-head uh, -head so called fusion sites, if you want to call them that, in, in the human genome. I'm actually going to be looking at another one and hopefully uh, publishing on that sometime in the future. But you can look, there's a number of chromosomes where this fusion site actually hit in multiple locations. And so Actually, my 2018 ICC paper, I showed that there were internal uh, human telomere sequences all over the human genome. And in fact, I actually was able to intersect those locations with various uh, ENCODE data sets and show that many of them actually are very functional. But I also queried the 798 base uh, pair so-called fusion site onto the chimp genome. And as you can see, I got a lot less hits. <laughs> but what about 2A and 2B where we should get really strong hits? Well, nothing there really at all. But that was just preliminary data. And that, when I really began looking into things, I found uh, these two papers that were published in 2002, actually by the same group. And so they actually sequenced 614,000 bases surrounding the, the uh, fusion site on human chromosome 2 because they were interested in really figuring out what was going on here with the fusion. And the one thing that I found in one of the papers, it looked like in one of the figures that the fusion site was inside a gene, although they didn't talk about it in the text of the paper, but they, they actually, it appeared in one of the figures. And in fact, there was genes all around the fusion site. So what are genes doing all over the place around the fusion site uh, if this, if this uh, supposedly involved telomeres? Because there are no genes in human telomeres. There are genes in sub-telomeres, but not in the telomeres. So what are all these genes doing around here? And what in the world is the fusion site doing inside a gene, or at least what would appear to be inside a gene? So... After noticing this, I began doing my own research. I went to the public databases and began pulling out uh, the fusion site based on more, more recent genomic data. Because, of course, in 2002, they, hadn't, they only had a rough draft of the human genome. But when I began investigating this further, uh, they had much better sequence for the human genome. And I began investigating it, and I noticed that the fusion site was indeed inside a gene. And so it's a long non-coding RNA gene. So uh, long non-coding RNA genes, they do not code for proteins. 
uh, but they code for functional RNAs, which are a very important feature of the human genome. Long non-coding RNAs now are, are actually considered to be the workhorses uh, of the human genome. Some of them stay in the nucleus, some go in the cytoplasm, some are even exported uh, out of the cell to other parts of the body. But anyways, this fusion site was a inside of a gene. But what in the world was this thing doing there? Well, it turned out that based on transcription factor binding site data, that the fusion site was actually a functional feature inside a gene. In fact, it was a second promoter inside a gene. So most genes in the human genome, whether long non-coding RNA genes or protein coding genes, have multiple promoters, including promoters inside the gene. And in fact, the fusion site uh, was a functional promoter inside this long non-coding RNA gene. It's a DDX101L2 is the name of the gene. So what was really interesting about this particular gene is that it produced long transcripts and short transcripts, and it looked like the fusion site was actually producing the short transcripts. In fact, there was actually a, there was, there was data showing that RNA polymerase II, which creates RNA from genes, RNA copies from genes, actually bound to the fusion site and created trans and was involved in creating transcripts, the shorter, the shorter transcripts. So we have the long variants produced from this gene and the short variants, uh, which started inside the fusion fusion site. So the fusion site basically is a functional promoter inside of a functional gene. And I've got all kinds of data showing that that particular gene was expressed in all sorts of tissues in the human body and is it even involved in red blood cell development. But if you had a fusion, you should also get a extra centromere. So centromeres are these little pinched off sections in this graphic here. Centromeres are very important. They're involved in cell division. And so the apparatus that separates chromosomes during replicated chromosomes during cell division will actually bind to the centromere and, and control that uh, process. So centromeres are very important functional features in chromosomes. Well, if you had a fusion of two small chimp chromosomes, you should get a cryptic centromere. And evolutionists actually claim, oh, there is a cryptic centromere even though there, it's less, uh, to them, it's less profound than the so-called fusion site. And so I began looking at the so-called cryptic centromere. <laughs> Interestingly, the cryptic centromere is itself inside a gene. So, you know, if you get these, if you get a so-called fusion going on, you should not get uh, functional genes in these sites that where there should be random chaotic events going on. So. The cryptic centromere is actually inside a humongous uh, protein coding gene that actually produces a transmembrane spanning protein that basically goes to the cell membrane. Part of it sticks out of the cell, part of it is inside the cell, and it's performing uh, important you know, features in communicating with the environment outside the cell and transducing that information into the cell. And so the, what, the reason the evolutionists thought uh, that this was a cryptic centromere is because it had these alphoid higher order repeats that you see. There's three of them there. But interestingly, uh, there is also a human specific uh, repetitive element that isn't even found in chimps uh, in this so-called cryptic centromere. And there's a line element as well. And so it's really not, not a solid evidence of a centromere. And in fact, I, I published on this showing how that, that really these alphoid repeats aren't even the same as what you would find in real centromeres anyway. So the cryptic centromere is, is bunk, just like the fusion site is bunk. In fact, it's part of a protein coding gene uh, with certain parts of it actually ending up in the translated protein that goes and does a functional feature in the cell membrane. So just to make a long story short and summarize uh, these things, and I've just basically given you really the most basic information from my research. If you want to read my papers, you can get a lot more detail 
uh, that is even more confounding for the evolutionary scenario. But the summary, it basically is, uh, number one, the chimp genome is no more than 84% similar to human. And if you were to include uh, the regions of the human genome, you could not align to chimp and vice versa. That similarity would probably be considerably less than 84%. I don't know what it would be. I'm guessing 80% or possibly even less. And of course, the alleged fusion site is not some random chaotic piece of evidence for a fusion or two chromosomes slamming together and fusing. No, it is a functional promoter inside of a functional gene that does important things. So, and finally, the alleged cryptic centromere uh, is itself also a functional feature uh, inside actually an important protein coding gene. And so I've also published papers uh, on a whole variety of pseudogene topics, actually analyzing a variety of so-called pseudogenes as well, but I'm not going to include those in this talk, but they are in my book, uh, Chimps and Humans, which you can get at icr.org. You just go to icr.org and there's a link uh, to our store, and then you can go there and find chimps and humans, a geneticist discovers DNA evidence that challenges evolution. And I also have another book called The Design and Complexity of the Cell, where I talk about various features in the cell and about how they're intricately designed and engineered in, in just a mind boggling, amazing way. And of course, all of this is evidence for Genesis being true and being accurate as, as Chris said at the beginning uh, of my talk. So anyways, that is it. And uh, I can answer some questions now if you would like. So Chris, take it away. Jeff, that was excellent. Thank you so much for presenting. Um, I thought it was really interesting to learn that the chimpanzee genome has been humanized and that's been recently acknowledged in the 2018 science paper. I can recall that you actually had mentioned that several times in the past that it had been humanized. So Nice to see that that is now acknowledged. Um, I just have a few questions from our audience for you, Jeff, if you have some time. Sure. Our, our first our first one comes from Gutsick Gibbon. That's her handle name. She says, are chimpanzees and bonobos different kinds? Great question. No, they're interfertile. They're, they're, they're chimps. <laughs> okay. This is from Standing for Truth. Uh, he says, have we derived a percentage of genetic similarity between humans using the same methodology used to get the 84% similarity between humans and chimpanzees? Would it be 99%? God bless. Yeah, that's a really great question. And it actually, I had a guy, he's a friend of mine. He's actually involved uh, in, the, in the Human Genome Project. His specialty is retro elements and transposable elements. And he's, I can't give his name because he's, <laughs> he's trying to lay low. Uh, but he alerted me to a paper that was published uh, several years ago where it talked about these regions of the human genome that have structural variation. They call them structural variants. So if you compare any two human genomes and you're just looking at what we call SNPs or single nucleotide polymorphisms, which are just single base changes, yeah, any two human genomes can be roughly 99% similar to each other. But if you compare the structural variance between any two human genomes, they can be up to four and a half percent different from each other. So if any two humans based on structural variance can, you know, be up to 5% difference from each other, why, how are we only 1% different from a chimp? So you know, we have a lot to learn, I think, about genome structure and variation and, and even in the human genome where they're still trying to uh, figure out all this structural variation that's present. So I think with this new DNA sequencing technology, the PAC bio sequencing technology, and there's, there's ion torrent and other chemistries out there as well. They're proprietary that produce long reads. I think we're going to see a lot of really amazing, uh, interesting things coming out of, of the Human Genome Project. Great job, Dr. Tompkins. Thank you. 
Another question from Creation Myths. Does a 1,000 base pair deletion present in one genome but not the other count as a single difference or 1,000 differences in your methodology? Uh, I'm not sure how I would answer that. I mean, it's it's <laughs> it's just a 1,000 base difference. So, yeah, I, I don't know that I would put any label on that necessarily other than it's just a difference. It's a 1,000 base difference, hypothetically, if that's what we're looking at. Yeah. Okay. This is, I from... mean, my, my, my methodology is, is looking at the overall picture, <laughs> not just trying to, you know, kind of narrow it down to some, uh, yeah. Anyways. Okay. Um, this is from Gus Gibbon. Do you have any predictions on the similarity between other kinds you would accept as so cats, lions dogs wolves rats mice do you feel genetics is the way forward with kinds <clears throat> i've actually looked at that uh, issue with a friend of mine who is a bioinformaticist uh, he worked in the biomedical field and now he's he was working for big pharma doing bioinformatics um it's really difficult You're, it's like comparing apples and oranges so when if you <laughs> If you were to look at, say, humans and rabbits or humans and rats or whatever, you've got different chromosome numbers, different chromosome structures, different gene neighborhood structures. So gene neighborhoods are very interesting. Uh, that's the, basically the, the content of genes within a, a large section of a chromosome. Uh, it's, it's almost impossible, really, uh, to compare you know stuff that is is so dissimilar um it, it, we we did make an attempt at it but and we tried to, to create these coefficients of, of similarity statistically uh but it was it it was just too difficult to to really get to the bottom uh, uh to the bottom of that okay this question is from joel duff he asks, from a young earth perspective, can we make a testable prediction about what the genetic similarity would be between a wolf and a gray fox or a cheetah and a lion using your methodology? That's an interesting question. I guess that, that would be a fun, uh, fun project to, to do that. That's interesting. Yeah. I, I don't know that we have really good quality genomes for these creatures. Um, we do we definitely do for dogs and, and wolves uh, a lot of research has been done there in dna sequencing um and with cats i know that there's been some some work done there as well but yeah that's that's interesting that would be a fun a fun project but it it would all be based on the overall quality of the genomes how complete they were uh but, but that's a great question Excellent. And this question again from Gusset Gibbons. Can you utilize some can you utilize some arguments to can you utilize these same arguments to argue that the other TT fusions, equids and suids, are bogus? Because they are also TT fusions in same kind species. Yeah, I don't know that they are uh, telomere telomere fusions. The ones I've pulled up in the literature were not. They involved alphoid uh I, yeah, I don't think they were telomere telomere fusions. Okay, any final thoughts on that? Okay, this no, question. No, I don't. Yeah, I, I did not detect any in my search of the literature mm -hmm. that were telomere telomere, other than in, in cancer cell lines where everything's basically gone hog wild in the genome. So. And of course, those are not healthy cells. Okay, we're getting some great questions in here. We have just a few more. This is from uh, Creation Myths again. Why are all the other instances of the DDX11 pseudogene family in sub-telomeric regions? And would you mind maybe explaining that for our, our lay audience? Yes, uh, I am aware of that, that they are in sub-telomeric regions. Uh, sub-telomeres actually have lots of genes and uh, in them, and they're actually very, very important uh, regions of the genome. Lots of, of gene activity going on there. 
Uh, no, I don't know why there's so many in those regions. Hmm. And then you also have the protein coding DDX genes as well, which are not in sub telomeres. So, uh, yeah, there's, there's actually a lot of gene family, uh, issues going on there. But of course, gene That's families are, in my opinion, are designed. Uh, they're, they're not the result of genome duplications. And I've actually talked with uh, evolutionists in the field about this. And so that's a whole other topic. <laughs> mm -hmm. Anyways, when I was in the genomics field, you know, in, in, in regular academia, um, yeah, a lot of these topics were being thrown around. There was a lot of ideas, you know, about them, but I don't think anyone had any solid answers. Great. Thank you for that detailed answer. This is from Hermit Crab. And then we have two more after that. Um, could I ask, could I ask how, sorry, let me read it here. Could I ask how one determines what is a pseudogene and what is not? Honest question. Thanks. Does presuppositions affect this determination? Thanks. Yeah, pseudogenes, uh, they have found out in the ENCODE project, uh, for the most part, are functional. Uh, the one that I found that was actually broken was the GULO pseudogene. And in fact, it, it for whatever reason, it tends to be broken in a lot <laughs> of creatures birds and various mammals and i think it's a real it is a real broken gene and that's and it's broken because uh well first of all sin entered the picture and caused the curse on creation and, and genomes have been devolving not evolving since uh the original creation so we should expect to see to see regions of the genome that that are mutated and, and broken just because uh, of that so yeah, genomes are not evolving and getting better. They're devolving and losing information. But most of the pseudogenes uh, that scientists have discovered are actually functional genes in gene networks. And I've documented this in a number of my papers. And of course, this is all documented, you know, through the ENCODE project, the Encyclopedia of DNA Elements project, uh, which kicked in in the early 2000s. They had their first round of papers published in 2007. And then did another huge round of papers that were published in 2012. But the ENCODE project is, has exploded. And so it's there's researchers studying pseudogenes, which technically are long non-coding RNA genes in the genome. And they, they function, uh, they're functionally important. A lot of them, uh, when they're broken, have been associated with human disease, like cancer, diabetes, heart disease, things like that. So long non-coding RNA genes are really, it's the hot area in, in biomedical genomics right now. Uh, so if you're a young person and you want to do a PhD uh, in, in genomics, I would get into the biomedical area and into some lab uh, that has ENCODE like funding and you would be definitely on the bleeding edge of what's going on in genomics and much of that is going on right now with with not only uh, epigenetics and histone modifications and uh, the 3d structure of the genome and so forth but uh, in long non-coding rnas which are are incredibly uh, important in the function of human health in the genome in fact, many protein coding genes now have antisense uh, transcripts that are produced as well as the protein coding transcript being produced. And the, the antisense transcript actually uh, regulates the transcriptional process and, and who knows what else it's, it's doing. But the, the genome now and, and what's going on is so complex that it's really, it's almost impossible for any one person to even wrap their brain around it at this point. But, Thanks, Dr. Tompkins. These next yeah. two, these final two questions. Sorry, did you have more thoughts? I don't want to cut you off. No, 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 I didn't. Okay, these final questions are anonymous sub submissions. Uh, this one here is related to what you're just talking about. How do you know the DDX11L2 gene or the non-translated pseudogene is functional? Well, there's databases uh, out there that show what tissues uh, it is expressed in, uh, the networks that it is a part of the gene expression network that is part of there's multiple databases that i accessed 
uh, it's actually in my papers that that data that I that I pulled out. Uh, some of these databases were in Japan, somewhere in the United States, with associated with the NIH, somewhere in England, associated with the Genome Project there. Uh, but yes, it has been placed within uh, functional uh, gene networks. Uh, like I said, one of them was associated with blood cell development and connected with a lot of other genes. So you can basically uh, create these maps where you can connect genes uh, based on their, their expression into networks and assign functionality to them uh, based on the processes that they're associated with, the tissues that they're expressed in. As I, I discussed this in my papers uh, associated with that particular gene. Very good, thank you. So this is our final anonymous question and then after that we're gonna close. So this is, um, Here's the question. A well-known creation scientist, Dr. Marcus Ross, has stated in a recent interview on YouTube that your estimate of 80% or 84% uh, chimp human DNA identity is inaccurate and should be closer to 94% because your analysis counted all differences equally, including duplications and insertions, and does not account for genome size differences. Is it true that if you account for these things, your estimate would be closer to 94%? No, actually, if we included the regions that were dissimilar uh, between human and chimp, and we included the dissimilarities in genome size, which they've actually measured with flow cytometry, uh, that it would actually be lower than 84%. And so Marcus Ross is a paleontologist, uh, and I don't know where he got his information about my research, but he, I actually did listen to what he said, and he I hate to say it, but he misrepresented my research and did not describe it accurately, uh, really at all. And so, okay, if Marcus I, Ross, if Marcus Ross wants to give me a phone call, I can I can get him on track with what I really did, and what and what the data really said. Okay, and we have one more question that was just posted. Do you want to answer this last one for us? This is uh, from Gusick Gibbon. She says, "One last question." If there is time, Dr. Tompkins, is there a reason why you switched your methods from ungapped and weighted to gapped and unweighted from 2015 onward? Yeah, I wanted to uh, include the, uh, make the alignments longer. Uh, when evolutionists first began comparing human and chimp DNA, they actually uh, did not gap the algorithm. The, alg the algorithm itself has been improving uh, significantly over time, especially, like I said, since I first began using it. And uh, and actually, the algorithm was improved based on my own complaints and interaction with the NIH and sending them data and, you know, from my analyses and convincing them that they needed to fix it. But so the algorithm has improved over time uh, where I could include a better alignment uh, features in it in, increase the the length of the alignments by by you know allowing for very liberal gapping but the algorithm's limited you know once it hits a gap that's that's so different or so big that it can't get through it it breaks off the alignment so so i'm just trying to improve uh, my research over time i guess would be the answer to that question and <laughs> and increase my, you know, alignment, the, the alignment capabilities of the tools I'm using. Because I want to get to the bottom of it as much as anyone does. So, yeah. Great response, I, doctor. Yeah. I mean, well, let me yeah. add this. You know, when I first mm -hmm. got into, when I was working at Clemson, I was not working uh, with human and chimp DNA. I was working with plants and insects and animals and even marine marine creatures uh, so when I got to the Institute for Creation Research, they asked me to investigate this issue. And I said, I'll, I'll give it a go. I don't know what I'll find. Uh, I've got no presuppositions about wh what the similarity is. I've got to dig into the literature. I've got to dig into the data and whatever I find, I find. And so, you know, that's what I did. And over the years, um, the tools have improved. I've utilized the improvement of those tools. I've tried to, to you know, increase the uh, mm -hmm. amount of data that I've used. And, and I've tried to use better data. Like I said, 
I finally had to abandon uh, the, uh, the old DNA sequence data that was produced with the Sanger style sequencing and, uh, and use this new data from this long read technology that I, in my opinion, is much better. So yeah, it's just been a long process, a long haul. And, you know, basically what I've shared tonight is, is, is the most up to date uh, assessment that I can give you at this point. So, you know, maybe in the future I can, I can have even more data to share, hopefully. So. Well, Dr. Tompkins, you've done some great research over the years. We're so grateful for your contribution and uh, we're about more than 15 minutes over. So we're gonna have to close pretty quick here. So Dr. Tompkins, thanks again for coming. Uh, excellent presentation. Great, great job with the questions. And as a reminder, I want to encourage anyone who is watching to check out the Logos Research Associates website. You can learn more about the various research efforts and research initiatives we're, we're, we're um, posting. We're hoping to get more funding for those. So please check it out. Submit your email address so you can stay updated. And we'll also give you some uh, heads up for these upcoming live broadcasts. We're going to have more creation scientists uh, present. And I think you're going to be really excited about what's ahead. So our next presentation... So our next presentation will be on Wednesday, June 14th at 9 p.m. Eastern. Our presenter will be geophysicist Dr. John Baumgartner, a Logos Research Associate who has done extensive research on catastrophic plate tectonics during the Genesis flood. So you'll want to mark that in your calendars. And with that, that's about it. So I'm just going to close in a quick prayer and we'll, we'll end. Dear Lord, thank you so much for all the participants, uh, skeptics, and um, seekers alike. We're so grateful that they're here. That's why we're doing this. We love them. We want them to uh, know who you are, that you're a real God, that you're a living God. So, Father, we just ask that you would encourage them. Thank you for this broadcast, and, and thank you for what lies ahead. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you all. Um, with that, stay tuned for our upcoming broadcast. God bless.